Hello, so in many ways this is the follow-up to the earlier discussion of Negri's entry in the conference and the text, The Idea of Communism from 2010. Um, I wanted to take up a very specific question because I think it is materially and politically pertinent to many of the crises which we presently do encounter. And that is, did the Cultural Revolution end communism? And I think it's a provocative question because in many ways, many of the resistances to the party state, to party-based politics does come out of the kind of logic which was initiated in the Cultural Revolution in the 60s and it had impacts in disparate parts of the world with people in Western Europe often uh, invoking its name and some still do today. Anyway, the subtitle is Eight Remarks on Philosophy and Politics Today by Alessandro Russo. To begin, the text which this essay is taken from makes the case that for the idea of communism to be reactualized, it would have to go back to that which is common. This has never been an easy historical matter. Rousseau points out that the manifesto of the Communist Party of 1848 and the statutes of the Chinese Communist Party of 2008 cannot be expected to have much in common. In such light, can we consider a migration of communism, or at least its name, from politics to philosophy? This too is no easy agreement, and you may notice the preeminent philosopher of our time, Alain Badiou, and Alain Badiou's metaphysical scaffolding would emphasize the intransivity between politics and philosophy, even if the former may be a site for the explication or confrontation between competing philosophical positions. Zizek's relation to Mao, similarly in terms of its characterization of the relationship between politics and philosophy. As Rousseau put it, quote, their separation is vital to both. Yet following Badiou, Rousseau would also acknowledge politics as a condition for philosophy. The interventive step marked by Rousseau is positing communism as a name for the ethics of philosophy regarding its political condition. This, I would remind our reader or onlooker, is a marked contradiction to its characterization as a mode of production which supplants capitalism with the latter having exhausted its productive or generative potential. So this is regarding, of course, the issue of communism. What is it for philosophy? What it may be for politics? He also acknowledges the state of the present doxa, which can think of no politics outside of state power. Concurrently, there is also the recognition of the threat of depoliticizing philosophy, a move which would debilitate philosophy itself. There seems to be a dilemma here, not as much of thought, but of maneuver. In renouncing a politics which seeks to gain state power, while at the same time resisting the depoliticization of philosophy, the philosopher is left with no bulwark of negotiation against the capitalist enterprise which often has its fingers in the organs of government in any case. The only alternative here is an embrace of the common, which Rousseau characterizes with the following statement. 
quote, politics can only be an invention for everybody, as absolutely egalitarian as philosophy itself, end of quote. Remarks you may notice which are not as readily accepted in a political climate which is anti-intellectual as fascist forces often are. In presenting hence the name of communism and noticing its historical manifestations, he may also present how this name may have markedly different destinies in politics and philosophy. In the former, for it to be periodized formally, we may cite a beginning, however unaccommodating of earlier tendencies marked by Marx's manifesto. In the latter, however, the author views it in continuity with a platonic idea materialistically reforged. We are also presented with a hypothesis, and I would add a welcome one, that the only politics worth discussing here articulates a singular desire to invent forms of mass self-liberation. And this being, I think, how uh, Rousseau may in some sense appear to be generalizing the predisposition that the present uh, configuration of forces appears to take. And to deploy its capacities in a register of unceasing subjective discontinuities. In terms of the characterization of politics presented here, a leaf is taken from Sylvian Lazarus in depicting its existence only in given sequences, brief and pertaining to a strong intellectual singularity. And here, the author makes a pressing point that each of these sequences, political as they are, have their own stakes and consequently their own politics. This brings us to the question, how is it possible to think the relationship between two distinct sequences? perhaps via an ethnography, if not a philosophy of the encounter. But more tellingly, how do we think the relationship between brief political sequences and often long periods of depoliticization? These are the queries brought forth. In placing such questions in a historical continuum, the issue of periodization does arise, and here we would have to mark a certain kind of end in the year 1990. This was a major change in state regimes with the collapse of the Soviet Union and almost all communist party states. As for the reason for this collapse, the author does present a vague and rather fantastic statement of uncertainty. Though we do know that the arms race with the US and the clause in the founding agreement between socialist republics upon the constitution of the USSR allowed any party to leave as they so desired. We do now arrive at what is the chief topic of the essay before our consideration. The issue of the ambiguity regarding the relation between the political events of the 60s, including May 68 in France, a landmark of the Cultural Revolution as seen from today, but also the Vietnam War and the dissolution of the USSR and the Eastern Bloc in the early 90s. If there ever was a political movement which by definition, by its very constitution, was heterogeneous in the strong sense, that is naming not merely a set of discrete bodies, parties or practices, but 
whom acted in its name in ways that are markedly different in several national situations, that would be the Cultural Revolution. Emblematic of this is when Mao meets with students and dissenters in 66 and proclaims that it is right to rebel against the government, charging that bourgeois elements had penetrated government and society acting to restore capitalism. This sequence, if it may be called one, is said to be marked by a closure in the 70s. And indeed, many, even in the West, identify this as the end of an epoch, perhaps even in the Foucauldian epistemic sense. A prerequisite or condition, as it were, is said to be necessary for examining this twofold termination. <sighs> or condition, as it were, is said to be necessary for examining this twofold termination, namely to disentangle the singular forms of political intellectuality appearing worldwide from what Padu would call that culture which constituted the language of the situation. Let me repeat this. Well, this sequence, if it may be called one, is said to be marked by a closure in the 70s. And indeed, many, even in the West, identify this as the end of an epoch, perhaps even in the Foucauldian epistemic sense. Uh, just to clarify, this is the uh, events of May 66, and of course, it's um, closure in the 90s, if that is the period we are considering. A prerequisite or condition, as it were, is said to be necessary for examining this twofold termination, namely, quote, to disentangle the singular forms of political intellectuality appearing worldwide from what Badiou would call that culture which constituted the language of the situation. End of quote. And I would like to point to the reader here how easily the culture in question may stand in for the structure of class relations. In terms of the emergence of a political formation which characterized these events that have marked the 60s and the 70s, whose historical significance can't be understated, the rise of political subjectivities which were categorically opposed to the party state is recognizable. Apparent in Mao's invocations to rebel against the party in the wildcat strikes in Italy and in the uprising that was May 68 in France, but also tellingly in the resistance to the Vietnam War in the US. These were all instances where there were mass organizations which were actively demonstrating and resisting uh, diktats by party states, by elected governments, and so on, both on both sides of the uh, political spectrum. The dissolution of feudalism in Europe took with it the enshrined system of the estates, nobility, clergy, merchants, etc., if a caustic parallel were to be drawn between that order and the welfareist consensus which existed between the party, the class, and the worker prior to the 60s, then we must ask which forces pressed against this consensus and whether the position taken up against it was indeed a progressive one. A form of political engagement did arise, however, which challenged this earlier historical order and perhaps does so even today, even as it has found no alternative to the form of the state. And here I do think that Arab Spring and the protests of Occupy Wall Street 
to speak of telling fissures. Yet, what we must remember of the Cultural Revolution is the cracking open of this universalist dimension, which consequently found voice and was able to reach out to those in similar stations and plights. Within the party hierarchy itself, that is, the Chinese Communist Party, the consequences of this exor exhortation to revolt led to a schism between Mao and Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. Most crucially, there was a disagreement over the role and the position of the Red Guard. Mao still harbored a vanguardist role, which they might play, whereas Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping considered their autonomy to be an anarchist force. This was not a light matter, and today any democracy does have to come to terms with the role and extent of autonomy they may wish to grant their standing army. A tension which has been palpable since Roman times. Decisively, the stake here was whether the Red Guard as an independent entity were to make political declarations or not. To reiterate, unlike students and workers, this was an armed force instituted by the state. A history of coups will remind us that no other force poses a greater threat to the party state, with Latin America and Pakistan serving off-sighted examples. Where does class struggle fit into this picture? The essay before us is less clear on the matter. However, the author asserts that a class-based vision was unable to re-politicize and in some unfortunate cases, references to class doctrine were deliberately used to create confusion. Indeed, the author stresses the former point regarding how a class-based vision hindered the development of new forms of political subjectivity. The creation of new Red Guard-like organizations remained a contention or other contentious issue even after the decision in 16 points released in August 1966 that stated that independent organizations were welcome. Of concern was the fact that most of these organizations would be started by sons and daughters of the party nomenclatura. And sadly, there may have been a tendency in such organizations to favor students from a good class background. If I might add, this was with, with the onset of the second generation, we also see a theory of lineage being offered by Yu Tong Lung, a curious commingling of dialectics and genealogy. The offspring of bad classes were supposed to be counter-revolutionary, whereas those of good classes were predisposed to be revolutionary starters. While simplistic, it is conceivable that the interests of the families would be guided by their class background, as would be their position vis-a-vis -vis the Cultural Revolution. Bad revolutionary theory, in any case. There even appears to have been some sort of internal bifurcation, with the Red Guard, with the Red Guards facing a challenge of some sort from the Scarlet Guards. There appears to be some suggestion. In gathering these influences, the author presents us with a conceptual history of the Cultural Revolution, which may be surmised as its most basic ideological presumptions. 1. Party states via a coagulation of the bureaucracy had become anti-political. 2. 
a class-based vision of politics was unable to revitalize parties, but was a hindrance to the development of new political subjectivities. 3. The inclusion of the political figures of the worker in the state was falsely political, even if it provided the scope for the emergence of new disciplinary forms. The first point here is now accepted as historical common sense. The ossification of uh, bureaucracies leading to the um, anti-political nature of states. Uh, and while commonsensical, there is still a degree of mass support for it and there is perhaps a tendency or other a tendency to gloss over this point, but it is a real one. With both Mao turning on the party and bureaucratic deadlocks in the Soviet Union, often between constituting nations being recognizable examples. The party which appears forlorn in this game of musical chairs between parties and independent organizations are the democratic socialists, who while positing their independence relied on the state as a regulatory body capable of facilitating the national distribution of goods and services which in any capitalist and perhaps even later state forms would remain commodities. The 1990s witnessed the gradual withering away of this formation, of which more may be gleaned in my review of Shankar Gopalakrishnan's work in India's case. We do have Alessandro Russo to thank, however, for providing a narrative which can link the crisis of the socialist states to events arising from the Chinese Cultural Revolution, most pointedly to an impasse in the relationship between the working class and the Communist Party. This was to change the functioning of the party and the general form of the organization of the state. There is a division observed by the author in the name of communism, operating in philosophy and in politics. As the subject of the conference which produced these papers and as an invocation of post-party political organizations, we notice this duality. Yet the Chinese Communist Party still persists and here is where the chief differences lie. Indeed, as the author indicates, the very existence of such a conference bears testament to the fact that the Cultural Revolution did not end communism as a philosophical idea, and an adjudication on the adequacy of its actions cannot be broached in the conference in question, concedes the author. The proper aim for a conference such as this, we are reminded, is perhaps often or rather is perhaps considered to think the relationship or rather, let me repeat. Or let's go back briefly, just to clarify whether there was any, you know, uh, discrepancies. Um, Indeed, as the author indicates, the very existence of such a conference, the one that produced these papers, bears testament to the fact that the Cultural Revolution did not end communism as a philosophical idea. And an adjudication on the adequacy of its actions cannot be broached in the conference in question. Um, I noticed that I haven't been very clear regarding you know, the adequacy of whose actions. Um, and in this case, I should prob probably clarify an adjudication of the uh, uses to which the name of communism has been put to in the philosophical realm. Uh, 
The proper aim for a conference such as this, we are reminded, is perhaps other considerations to think the relationship between politics and philosophy upon which we are provided some interesting observations by Rousseau. To quote, philosophical resources have strengthened political inventions, yet have also obfuscated the singularity of political intellectuality in a given sequence. Indeed, such conferences are held materially to invent new relations between philosophy and politics. In this regard, we would do well to cite, but more importantly, read developments in French philosophy since the 60s. Many, many of the philosophers who have provided conceptual inventions, which open new dimensions in our relationship to the state, for example, as fresh or weathered a Marxist question as any. Here, the names Sartre, Althusser, and Badiou would be guiding lights. The last name, perhaps crucially for philosophy, charting his ontology as an attempt to think its conditions. Let me repeat that. The last name, perhaps crucially for philosophy, charting his ontology as an attempt to think its conditions, which may indeed be mutually independent or not. A delightful problem for theorists of cognition, particularly the Hegelian kind, reification and indeed set theory. The closure which communism may have faced in the 90s and even earlier is reflected strongly in the lives of the contributing theorists and has constituted something of a repressive horizon some have lived with. Its re-emergence as a drive, indeed as a desire in philosophy, speaks for the import which our theorists touched upon, or rather speaks, or rather, let me repeat this, its re-emergence as a drive, indeed as a desire in philosophy, speaks for the import which our theorists have brought to some of the issues touched upon. Perhaps most crucially, the call in philosophy tied to the concept of equality. The communist horizon as seen in this light would establish a terrain for intellectual friendship by thinking com possibilities. Now this is the brief paper that I wanted to read out to you. Um, I'm not sure whether it is better than perhaps having the text itself before your consideration, but in case you would prefer to listen to it rather than to actually read it, and in case I've been clear enough in my delivery, you may follow it here as well. Now, I'm not sure whether I shall return to the text, the idea of communism, but I just may read the concluding statement which Zizek um, does um, present there, and it is titled, How to Begin from the Beginning, or something similar. But the reason I wanted to share this one with you is because I think in many ways this maps up, indeed, it may indeed constellate certain major tendencies within politics, both interstate and, you know, intrastate that are actualizing themselves today amongst various forces in several national situations. I think um, even if it perhaps is not as focused on certain tendencies which are proffered to um, highlight the um, uh, prime time hours of news shows and th things of that nature. And yet I think there is a point to a political, a historical sociology which seeks to decipher the um, 
the initial impetuses which some of the tendencies we encounter today might have been um, guided by, so to speak. Anyway, I'll leave the text below. And as always, I welcome your analysis, your criticism, your feedback, and of course, any other suggestions that you may have. And that is all for today afternoon. Thank you for your time. I hope you have a pleasant day. Bye-bye.